Greetings everyone. Welcome back to Multivariable Calculus. I'm Professor Simon and it's time to get started with multivariable integration. We start this unit journey with the double integral. First a quick reminder from Calc 1. The single integral, if you remember, on a, on a definite scale, whenever you want to integrate along an interval from A to B, is defined as this limit as we let the number of rectangles uh, that we use to approximate the area here go to infinity. And we're basically just summing up all of the areas. The function is the height and the delta x is the width of each rectangle. And the, the limit as n goes to infinity just means that each rectangle keeps getting smaller and smaller and you decrease this little region of error right here, the, uh, the under approximation in this case that I've drawn here. Um, and basically you should get the idea that the integral is just adding up a bunch of function values, okay? And as n goes to infinity, the, the delta x gets smaller and becomes the dx, which of course also links it to the derivative through that differential, okay? So also point out that a single variable function domain is an interval on the x-axis. So when I integrate something like this, I'm integrating along this line here. And it's going to, you know, have this interval from A to B. And we're just slicing it up. And eventually, when you get to the integral itself, you're slicing it up into all the different function values. So if you recall, we can actually approximate these single variable integrals using the left and right hand sums. The case that I've done here is I've used four rectangles on an interval from one to three for the function x squared. So of course the, the delta x, the width of the rectangles is b minus a divided by n. So that in my case is three minus one divided by four since I'm using four rectangles. And the function being x squared, I'm gonna start with the left hand sum uh, with the lower number one squared and then make four total rectangles um, notice the 3 minus 1 over 4 is 2 over 4, which is 1 half. So that means it's going to go up by a half every time uh, I go from one to the next. So 1, 1 and a half, 2, 2 and a half. The next one would be 3, but that would be like using this right-hand side over here, which is not actually going to be the, the height of a left-handed rectangle. And notice I do actually have four heights here. So then... Uh, once I square these out, add them up, and then multiply by the one-half over here, what I get is 27 over 4, and that's going to be an under-approximation. Of course, the, the, the way we know that that's an under-approximation is through the graph. Uh, if you do actually graph out a parabola, you'll notice that if you take nothing but left-hand side rectangles, just like the one I have here, it, they all end up being underneath the curve. So I know that 27 over 4 is an approximation and it's less than the actual amount. Vice versa, if you do a right-handed sum, the only difference here is notice I started with the 1.5 because that would be the right-hand side of the first rectangle. And then I just keep going, uh, adding the 1 half until I hit the other endpoint, 3. Uh, again, squaring these, adding them up, multiplying by the half gives me 43 over 4. And I know that that's an over approximation because my rectangles would be above the, the curve when you graph that out. So what I do is I take these two and average them, right? Add them together, divide by two, and you get 35 over four, which is 8.75. The actual value of this integral is eight point continuous six. So this actually 35 over four is not a bad uh, approximation for this integral. Okay, so all of that should have seemed somewhat familiar, and maybe I dredged up some, some bad memories from Calc 1. <laughs> Let's uh, create some new, well, hopefully good memories for Calc, multivariable Calc here. So it's a very similar idea, the double integral over a region, okay? Let's, let's 
take a step for a second to the side and just remember that we're doing a multivariable function of two variables, x and y. So I can't just do uh, two numbers, a to b anymore, like with a single variable. I have to do a region of the domain, right? Some, some cutout of the xy plane, some region. And that's what you put here, okay? That's what you'll be putting uh, for your boundaries, basically. And then, of course, somewhere else you'll define your region. The region that I've defined for this moment is rectangular. And you know it's going to be rectangular when you let uh, x and y be limited by just solid numbers. Okay? Just like over here, uh, x is limited by two numbers, so you just get a, a section, an interval, right? Same thing here, but x and y are both limited in intervals. And when you put those two together, right, from P to K here and from A to B on the x axis here, notice you get a rectangular region. So then the double integral is defined as the limit as M goes to infinity, the limit as N goes to infinity, sum from I to N, uh, I 0 to N, and sum J from 0 to M. Let F be evaluated at the x, i, y, j point, and then have that multiplied by the area of the i, j component, okay? Now, this is a very generic definition, uh, a more generalized version of this one, okay? The way I have it set up allows for independence for the x and y dimensions and even some independence in how you slice them up. Um, rather than, you know, just one particular slice. Um, sometimes you might see a definition on this that has only one summation or has only one uh, thing for the, for the area. Uh, I was just trying to be a little bit more generic here because at some point in your future, uh, some integrals may have to be done independently like that. Okay? But also this leads you to, um, later on, we're going to talk about something called Fubini's theorem. This is, a, this is basically an intro to that. So this is what's happening. I'm letting M and N just be two quantities that are going to infinity. And what they are is the maximums of these summations, right? Just like here, N was the maximum of this summation. So as you can, uh, as you can clearly see, M and N are the number of uh, rectangles, right? The number of slices that I'm breaking up the different dimensions into. The I dimension, as you can see, is related to X. The J dimension is related to the Y direction. So the, the N is going to be the number of rectangles, the number of slices for the X. And M is going to be the number of slices for Y. And as you would expect, the, the larger I let these numbers be, the smaller the slices get. Okay? but we're not just slicing little pieces uh, on a line anymore. Remember, we're doing a rectangular region in the xy plane. Okay, we're, we're integrating over this. So the more I slice these things different ways, what I'm actually taking out of the domain are little bitty small pieces of area. And that's this, okay? Um, so, big picture. The single integral was trying to approximate an area between the x-axis and the curve. Here, the double integral is trying to approximate the volume between the xy plane and the surface of your function. Okay? That's, that's the, the, the link between these two types of things. Now, eventually, of course, not all integrals are calculating areas. They're huge uh, generic infinite summing machines. And that's the same thing for double integrals. Um, the difference being, of course, the reason why I need the double is because I have two input variables. But this is the, this is the connection to get you going here, okay? So this particular setup, the easy way to visualize it is that I'm trying to find the volume underneath this surface to the xy plane. And this is a, a, an example rectangle solid Okay, it's like a prism, a rectangular box of one of the pieces that I'm slicing up. So if I, if I pick a certain size M and N, I can slice a rectangle 
into the into the domain region and then the volume of that rectangle is one of my approximation uh, pieces to the to the summation okay um, there's going to be n times n number of these rectangular prism because there's going to be n slices in one way and m slices the other way so the area that you're actually going to integrate here is very similar to the way you do your interval slices here. You take your end minus your beginning and divide by how many rectangles you want to use. So notice that appears here again, b minus a over n, because that's the limitations for x, right? On the x-axis, I go from a to b, and I want n number of those x rectangles. Uh, then in the y dimension, something similar, it goes from uh, p to k, and I want m number of rectangles for that, so k minus p over m. Now, why am I multiplying these two? If you'll notice, the delta a here is a piece of the rectangle, but it is itself also a rectangle. Imagine the bottom of this prism right here, this little piece, being a delta a piece, one little piece. Okay, so I'll just be doing the length of it times the width of it. Once I slice up the x and y directions, right, this is going to be the length, this is going to be the width of a small rectangular piece, a very small piece that I'm adding up from the domain. So it's length times width. Okay, so it may not look like it at first glance, but that is just the, the next step up from the normal definite integral that we're accustomed to, to doing here. So just like the definite integral can be approximated, I can also approximate the double integral. Here what I've done is I've chosen n is 2 and m is 2, and I've done the under and over approximations and averaged them just like over there. Okay, But notice uh, what we had to do here for these things is I had to take into consideration uh, where I was grabbing my function values. Just like over here, right, I took the function values to the left and the function values to the right. Here, it's more like beginning and, and, and ending, or before and after, right, because I have two different dimensions to worry about here. Um, so when I'm, when I'm looking at this, the way I'm slicing up the approximations is I'm noticing that uh, if this is my whole rectangle, region R, right? In other words, if you pick this up and put it down, I'm doing two N's and two M's, right? So that's just slicing like this. So that this way N equals two, and this way uh, M equals two, right? This will be your, your X axis and this will be your, your y-axis. I know it's, it's counterintuitive. I'm trying to draw it the way it's drawn here. Okay, so then, here, let me section this off here, because this goes for, for here. What I've done here by letting n equal two and m equal two is I've taken the, the region that I'm interested in, which goes from four to six on the x-axis, right? So four is here, uh, I'm sorry, the other way around. 4 is here, 6 is here, that's going this way. And then on the y-axis, uh, negative 1 to 3, see on the y, negative 1 and 3? So it goes from negative 1 to 3, right, and 4 to 6 here. So then the way I'm picking my points for the under and over approximation is not much different than the way we chose our under and over approximations over here. My function is a, a 3D version of the x squared over here. I'm just doing x squared plus y squared, right? So it's a, uh, it's a uh, circular paraboloid, right? The, the cup shape. Um, I know this is just a generic surface over here. Don't, don't think of it. This is not the same function as this, but it's the same idea of the rectangular prisms. Okay, so I took my region uh, from four to six and negative one to three, and if I'm letting n equal two and m equal two, then my under approximation 
Uh, remember, the, the cup is coming out at you right here, and the cup is going up, right, as I go further out uh, in the domain here. So what I've done for the under approximation is I picked these four points, okay? And each one of those points is going to represent the, the rectangle that it's connected to. So this point right here is going to represent this rectangle. This point right here is going to represent this one here and here, right? Those are going to be the under approximation because the way this thing is coming out at you, the, the piece of the, of the cup, right, the piece of the paraboloid that goes this way is going to be lower here and then higher here. And I'm basically using the function values at each of these points, the Z values that are coming out at you, to represent the, the height of these rectangles, okay? So that's this right here. Notice right here, this is uh, F of four negative one, right? That's this point right here, okay? This right here is F of four one, that's here. This is F of uh, five negative one, which is here. And this is F of five one, which is here. And then multiply uh, these heights by the area of one of these things right here. Notice this is going to be two over two, which is one. And the width of each of these rectangles is one. And three plus one over is four over two, which is uh, two. So the width right here is two and two, right? The width of those rectangles like that. <clears throat> so once you add these up and multiply the one and the two, you actually get 172, which is an under approximation, okay? Vice versa, for the over approximation, um, what I did was I chose the four squares here, 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 and here to represent this way, right? Okay, so I picked the height of the function here to represent this rectangular prism here, and so on and so on. And it's the same idea, right? Since I'm picking things that are further out in the domain, and this thing is coming out at you higher and higher, I'm going to be over approximating by picking the larger values. And it's still the same areas here. It's still one times two, one times two, one times two for each of these little areas, right? Each of these rectangles has an area of one by two. So two total, right? Okay, so this is uh, f of five one, f of five three, f of six one, f of six three. That's these points here. Okay, and I'm doing the, the function values to represent the, the heights of those rectangles. Add all those up, multiply by the, the area of the rectangle uh, of the base, and you get 284, which is our over approximation. And then, of course, I get the mean of those two to make it more accurate at 228. The actual uh, value of this is more like in the lower 220s, but as you can see, uh, not too bad. It is, it is still pretty close uh, to the actual uh, value here. Okay. <clears throat> so I, I just wanted you to see here that the, the, the definition of what we're doing is still very much the same as what you were doing with single variable integrals. Okay. And in the, in the next scene, what you're about to see is we'll use limits to actually find the real value of these uh, and parallel those for you. <clears throat>
the way we set this up is we figure out our width, B minus A over N, of all of the different rectangles. In that case, if we're going from 1 to 3, 3 minus 1 is 2, 2 over N is our width. And then the way I figure out my X sub I uh, pieces, the X's that have to go in order, I start with the left hand side, 1, the lower side, and I add the width times the, uh, the interval number, right? So 1 is the first one, then I go up by 2 over n, then I go up by 2 times 2 over n, right? Then 3 times 2 over n, then 4 times 2 over n, so on and so on until I reach the other end of the interval. But of course, as I let n go to infinity, you know, these things tend to, you know, infinitesimal widths. And uh, I can actually uh, use the limit in the very end to figure out the exact uh, integral value. So here, all I've got to do is just simplify this part first so I can then take my limit. Um, so I square this out, right? We multiply this out. The 2 over n I just bring to the front. Because it doesn't have an i, I can pop the 2 over n out of the summation. And then, of course, I use our little summation uh, methods where the, the sum of a number is just that number times the maximum or, or times the number of iterations. From 1 to n is n number of iterations, so n times 1 is n. And then, of course, uh, 4 over n is a number I can multiply on the outside. And the summation of just i, right, where i goes from 1 to n, is n times n plus 1 over 2. And then remember the same thing with the i squared. The summation of the i squared is n, n plus 1, 2 n plus 1 over 6, right? Um, and then the 4 over n and the 4 over n squared are just multiplied numbers to each of those individual summations. So I'm using my rule of summation that I can do each of these three added pieces separately. Um, and then I get these. When I multiply these things all out and do all of the reductions with the fractions, I get something more similar to this. And basically, after I multiply these things out, anything with an n left in the denominator as n goes to infinity is going to go to zero. And all of the other pieces don't have n's at all. So the limit of the numbers just gives me the numbers. And I end up with 26 over 3, which is around 8.6 continuous, right? And of course, you remember our approximation here was 8.75 when we averaged the uh, lower and upper sums, right? So you can see that our approximation was pretty close, right? Not too bad uh, when we did the, the mean approximation. So a very similar process just with a lot more steps for a multivariable uh, double integral. Okay, so the double integral needs a double summation. And, and like I said, I've seen um, versions of this where they use a single summation. The problem with those is the, the way you have to number the points. If you only have a single summation, then you only have one thing changing. And so you have to number your things 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, right? Like that. Um, if I use a double summation like this, I'm allowing X and Y to number themselves independently, and I can make like a grid out of it uh, from the formation, okay? It doesn't really complicate things too much because all, most of the um, pieces that have X only involve I, and most of the, oh, all of, in our case, all of the pieces that involve Y only have J. And so when you have a double summation on something, here's an example, a double summation on something that's just a function of one of those variables, right? In this case, a function of I. Then the summation of J just looks at him like a constant, like a number. So you just get M times that function from this inner piece, and that M is just brought outside of the other summation. So if you have a double summation of something that only involves one of the letters from your two summations, you really just end up with a constant uh, from the other summation. And then it's back to normal, uh, you know, normal rules with a single summation. Okay? So look, I've set up uh, our double integral here over the region where X goes from 4 to 6 and Y goes from negative 1 to 3 of x squared plus y squared. That's the, the integral that we approximated in the previous scene and got 228. 
So then uh, I saved a little space by putting my limits together in one listing. Can't do that with summations though. So I have my double summation, right? Uh, N and M are my uh, choices for slicing up the X and Y directions. My B minus A over N is the width that I'm slicing up the X direction, right? So that's six minus four, two over N. And then K minus P over M is how I'm slicing up the Y direction, right? So that's three minus negative one, which is four over M. I'm just gonna multiply those together and get eight over NM or NN, right? And just bring that out because there's no variables in that. It's gonna be the same width. That's, that's the way we choose our integrations at this level. We, we, we square them off and do the same pattern over and over again, okay? Now, of course, the x is going to start at 4, and I'm doing his width times i to iterate it. And the y values start at negative 1, and the width is 4 over m, and then iterating it times j. And, of course, this is x squared plus y squared, right? That's my function. So then the first thing I do is I try to simplify the, the fact that this is a double summation. And it's just like I was saying here, if I do a double summation uh, over the plus, I can do it to each one of these two pieces here. And if I do the double summation of something with just i, right, then I'm just going to get the m times the sum of that i thing. Vice versa, if I do the double sum on something with just j, I'm going to get n times the thing with just j in it, right, with the summation of just j. Well, now these two are just... Uh, separate single sums that are very similar to the one that we did over here. I'm going to multiply and distribute the 8mn to each one of these two. And when I do uh, times m, I just get 8 over n. And when I do times n, I just get 8 over m. Next, by limit laws, I can distribute the limit to each one of these things. And the limit with m of something with nothing but n's in it, right? Because that's all this is going to be, nothing but n's. The, the, m, the limit as m goes to infinity doesn't do anything. It just is itself. So there's no limit for m in this piece. And when I do the double limit over here, uh, and I've gotten rid of all of my n's after I do that multiplication, same idea, right? The, the, the limit as n goes to infinity doesn't affect this, so it doesn't uh, appear anymore, OK? Don't think of it as, oh, I, I split up the two limits and gave one to each. No, I actually did both limits to both. But since there are no of the other variable in each one, right, the, those limits just evaluated as uh, themselves, right, the, the internal piece. Now, it's just like the ones over here. Uh, I'm just going to perform this limit and I'm going to perform this limit. Uh, the same way as before. I'm going to do the summation of the, the 16, right? That's just going to give me 16n. The summation with the i is the n, n plus 1 over 2. The summation with the i squared is n, n plus 1, 2, n plus 1 over 6, right? Same thing over there, just with m's. Then, if I multiply everything out, remember everything with a variable in the denominator as it goes to infinity vanishes to zero leaving me only with the number portions that don't have n's or m's in them from both sides. And then when I add up all of the numerical values, I get 664 over 3, which is 221 point continuous 3. And if you remember, our approximation was 228. Not too terribly bad considering all we did was four rectangular prisms for our approximation. Not a very, you know, close uh, scheme there. However, you know, we didn't do too bad because of the way we averaged the upper and lower uh, approximations. Okay? So I want you to notice just how this is the exact same idea as doing the, the old school integrals that we've been doing. Okay? Also, take a quick note. The way I've set it up really facilitates the idea that I was able to, at some point, not at the beginning, but at some point, I was able to just evaluate just the x stuff and just the y stuff, right? Because of the way we can arrange our, our algebra at one point or another, you should be able to do that with pretty much any one of these basic ones, right? Now, of course, as they get 
further and further along, the, the limits of these things become really, really hair pulley. And that's, of course, why we don't do this very much with single integrals either, right? It's just the idea that this is where it comes from. And same thing with this one, okay? So in the next scene, we'll talk about how we actually evaluate this using our uh, integral rules uh, the same way we always used to, okay? So just to give you an idea of what we've been talking about in the last couple of scenes from a visual standpoint, uh, I've got the function uh, f of x equals x squared plus y squared here. And just notice that it is the, uh, the circular paraboloid that we've been talking about here. And we said that we were interested in a region where the, the x is going to vary from 4 to 6. So notice this is the x variation here. And the y is going to vary from negative 1 to 3. That's from here to here. Then uh, I'm letting my n be 2 right now and my m be 2 also. So what's going to happen is I'm basically splitting this region into just 2 by 2. And the, the rectangular prisms that I'm getting from here are these guys right here. Okay, so the, the y values are split into two, and as you can see, the x values are split into two regions also. And so I'm actually getting a total of just four of these prisms. Um, so this, what I have visualized here is the under approximation, as you can see that all of the, the rectangles are using just the function values on the, the uh, corners here and here. And then the, the corner here, you can see the actual z value is this line here. Okay, so this is the under approximation that we computed with the just the four function values. But if I were to increase, say, and let m be four and n be four, right? So in other words, you can see that there are now four little subsections here and four subsections here. You can see, just like you would expect in, in the original integrals from Calc 1, the rectangles uh, solids here are smaller and they would actually approximate the, the curve much, much better, right? And if I turn the curve off, you can see that they're not all the same level, right? You can tell that they are uh, all like trying to follow the curvature there of the, uh, the paraboloid here. So to sum this up some more, uh, just look at what happens the, the more rectangles we put into this thing, right? Let's, um, let's increase this thing as much as we possibly can. And just notice, with this many uh, rectangles in each dimension, right, it's 12 by 12. So we have 144 rectangular prisms here that we've sliced and diced our, our region into. And you can tell you're getting a really nice, uh, you know, shape approximation there to this curve. You can see it looks just like the, the shape there now. And this is essentially what we're doing when we take the limiting value, right? We're, we're letting these rectangular solids get smaller and smaller uh, until they're actually just the, the size of one of these Z values themselves, right? That, that's what the infinitesimal uh, area DA would be if I could let each one of these just be the size of a point, each one of these area pieces here. Now let's step it up to actually doing the, the calculus rules with antiderivatives and how we would work that in a multivariable situation. So just real quick, remember, the way we would have done the integral that we were approximating in the single version there is I would have just done the antiderivative of x squared, 1 over 3x to the third, and evaluated it from 1 to 3, which would give me 1 third times 27 minus 1, which is the 26 over 3 that we computed. And yes, that is much, <laughs> much less work than, of course, using all of the summations and the limits. But of course, the summations and the limits do have a purpose and a, a point uh, to understanding what's actually going on, okay? Now, in multivariable, we have what's called an iterated integral, 
and in this case iterated really is synonymous with partial if you will uh, we've been doing partial derivatives up until this point right so a partial integral is of course the same idea where you would be performing an integral while keeping one variable as a constant right so just one of the letters would be unaffected and just sort of carry all the pieces as if it were a multiplied or added number uh, inside of the integral, okay? And the idea of this you've actually been doing since the Calc 1 version of these integrals, right? All the time we put, you know, times C or plus C or whatever in these things and you integrate while keeping those other letters constant, right? You, you already know which variable you're integrating in an integral because of the differential that's attached to complete the, the integral statement. So always, whatever the, the differential letter is, is the only thing that's actually being integrated, and that hasn't changed. In an iterated integral, well, we're just going to take some sort of antiderivative, but in a partial sense, right, to get some function, and we're only going to be evaluating the, the variable in question from A to B. Also, these A's and B's don't have to be numbers. They can be functions of the other variable. Typically, that only makes sense if it's the first of two iterated integrals, though. Okay? We'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. So here's Fubini's theorem. It states that a double integral of some function over some area inside of some region, okay, is going to be equal to the double iterated integrals of the function where dy times dx represents our dA differential, okay? Now remember, dA is some sort of small area piece that we were doing rectangles for them, right? A bunch of little rectangles. Whereas dy and dx are like the, the sides of this, right? dy and dx are going to be the sides of the area, this, the infinitesimal piece of area. So those are different differential setups, but they're equal in the, in the sense of what we're doing here, okay? And in fact, when you do these uh, later on in the, in the chapter, you'll see it actually doesn't matter which coordinate system you pick. We could also pick polar and cylindrical and all those other things to, to split double and later on triple integrals into just lists of iterated integrals. Okay? Now what you need to see on these things is that what we really have with these iterated integrals is we're just integrating an integral. Right? That's how a double integral works. Like this, look, I could put a, a set of brackets here to show you what I mean. Notice what I'm doing is one iterated integral, and then whatever that answer is, I'm doing the integral of that with the other variable, the other dimensional variable. Okay? So with these iterated integrals, I'm just turning a double integral into two iterated integrals, an integral of an integral. Okay? And that should make sort of sense to you if you uh, think back to what we just did a second ago in the, in the last scene where I was able to at one point algebraically split up and do just the I portion and just the J portion, right? And that's essentially what's going on here with the iterated integrals. I'm going to do just the Y integral and just the X integral, but the difference is one of them feeds the other in this sense. Okay, I don't actually split them up um, all the time. If, if they're multiplied, you actually can split them up, but uh, we don't have that here. I'll, I'll show you what I mean in the, in, in the next scene. Okay, so here, I want to perform this double integral like what we were doing uh, before. Okay, now a double integral is a singular object. It is a summation over a two-dimensional domain. Okay, that's what a double integral is. It is, however, equal to the same calculation as two iterated integrals. So I can take this double integral and I can rewrite it as, and notice I can pick dy dx or dx dy, okay? 
um, as you're going to see in a second, I'll, I'll pick uh, dy dx. Um, but it doesn't matter which one you pick in this case because we're doing nothing but numbers, right? Later on, if some of these are, are trapped by functions, the order will matter. So the iterated integral for this one is going to be from 4 to 6, and then the integral from negative 1 to 3. My function is x squared plus y squared. And you notice how the integral that's closest to the function, right, is the y. So I'll put dy, sort of like parentheses, right? If I open the y parentheses, I'm closing the y parentheses here. And then next out, I open the x, so I'm gonna close the x here, okay? And I could have just as easily done dx dy uh, if I would have just swapped the, the two integrals here. And again, the reason why in this case I can do that is because it's nothing but numbers and there's no dependence between x and y uh, according to my area region. x and y are independent, it's just a rectangular region. Okay, so first game is to just do the inside integral. Forget the four to six and the dx exists for a minute, and I'm gonna just do this iterated integral. What that means is y is my partial integral here. So my variable is just y. So this is what happens. I get, this is still here, and then the integral of x squared dy is x squared times y. Because x squared is just a number according to y, so I integrate one basically, which gives me y. Next, plus one third y cubed, because I'm integrating y squared dy. And then, of course, this is going to be where y equals negative 1 to y equals 3. And my dx is still here. All right? So notice what I've done is just the y integral, right? That is an iterated integral. Next, I'm going to plug in my values, and then that will give me something that I can complete my x integral with. Okay, so... I have integral from four to six. If here for the y, I'll just be doing three minus negative one, which is gonna give me four times x squared, uh, plus one third times, and right here I'm gonna have three cubed minus negative one cubed, which is 27 minus negative one which is going to be 28, the x. Okay, make sure you're with me there. I basically treated these two like separate entities, and I did top minus bottom for the y, and then I did top minus bottom for the y cubed. Depending on the way your integral is set up, you know, sometimes I'll do it separately like that, sometimes I'll do it all together. Uh, you know, just whichever one's more convenient. In this case, since they were straight, real easy y's, it was easy just to do each one individually. All right, now we're back down to calc one, right? This is just a single integral and it has nothing but X's in it. So then I have uh, four thirds X cubed plus 28 over three times X. And that's gonna be evaluated from four to six. So then just like before, you know, it's easier to, to do them in pieces. I'm going to have four thirds times uh, 216 minus 64, because that's six cubed minus four cubed, plus 28 over three times uh, six minus four, right? Because that's the X. Uh, so let's see, after you crunch all of this together, I'm going to get 664 over 3, which is exactly what we found when we did the, the limit version, right? Okay, so here, as you can see, is a much nicer way than, of course, doing all the double limits and the double summations, which you should have expected was coming. 
And the way this works is we just break double integrals, a single inter it's a single object over an area, into two iterated integrals that can both flow along their individual dimensions. Here's an example of a double integral that the region doesn't just come from uh, number limitations on x and y. Also, this is a double integral that doesn't necessarily represent a volume when you add it up all at once like it is. Don't forget from Calc 1, the, the integrals are blind. They add positive and negative function values just like adding numbers left and right. Okay, here it's, it's you know, three dimensions, left, right, up, down. And since not all of the function that I'm integrating is above the xy plane, I am actually going to be adding some positive and some negative z values. Okay, so the answer to this integral is not necessarily a volume. It is an integral, right, a, an integration of z values, a, a summation of all the z values in a region. Okay, so what we have is we want to do the double integral of the plane 7 minus 3y minus 5x over the region r, where the region r is described as all of the points x and y that are in between the curve y equals x squared and the horizontal line y equals 25. All right? So notice now it's not a rectangular region, so I can't just put beginning and ending and beginning and ending for my two integrals. All right? There's two ways to set this up, and you can always convert between the two depending on what you feel like integrating. So let's do it uh, one way, and then I'll show you how we would switch it to the other. <clears throat> so notice I'm going to start by, of course, using Fubini's theorem in that I am going to uh, equate this into a pair of iterated integrals of my function. And in this case, I'm going to do uh, dy dx. Okay? Because um, notice everything's already in terms of y equals here. So here's what I'm actually going to do for this particular one. I'm going to notice that all of my uh, y directions, like uh, when I'm, remember when you're integrating dy, right, then you're integrating sort of by picking an x value and then integrating between two objects. So that would be like picking an x value like this, and then I'm going to integrate just this section here and then so on and so on and so on my dy is integrating in the y direction so my y values are in between x squared and 25 so my y integral here is going to be from x squared to 25 okay so then what are my x's going to be? Well, I need to be able to pick all of the x values that represent this, right? Where do these two intersect? Here and here, right? So I need to know how far left and right to go. Well, y equals 25 hits x squared when x is either 5 or negative 5. So that's what I'm going to be integrating from negative 5 to 5. And the shape that we're going to get here, by the way, is if you can imagine that, that uh, filled-in parabola, but mapped up onto the plane, right? The plane's not exactly level. So the parabola won't be necessarily um, symmetrical-ish, but it, it will be proportionate to what it is in basically the shadow of it put up into the plane. And then you're going to be integrating the z values either beneath or above depending on whether the, the, the surface of the plane is above or below the xy plane, right? So for example, on, um, on this inner side closer to the origin here, you'll notice the, the plane is above. So we'll, we'll be integrating, you know, above the xy plane uh, here. But then when you get further out 
in this region over here, it'll actually be adding beneath right there. So we're going to have a, a combination of positive and negative z values here. That's why this particular integral is not going to be just equal to a volume. They don't have to be equal to volumes. This might be some sort of summing up of total energy or something like that over a region, or whatever, right? For now, it's just a practice problem. So notice I can have an iterated integral where one of the integrals is dependent on a function of the other variable. And that's okay as long as the functions are on the inner integral. I don't want variables on the outer integral. That wouldn't make sense, okay? Because y is going to depend on x, and then I'm doing an integral of x to sum everything up, okay? It needs to be in that kind of order. So then let's iterate our integral here. Integral from negative 5 to 5. Uh, I'm going to have 7y minus 3 over 2y squared minus 5xy. And y is being iterated from x squared to 25 dx. So then if I plug in all of my values here, um, I'm going to have the integral from negative 5 to 5, uh, 7 times 25. I'm going to do all of the, the top values first, right, minus the bottom ones. It should make it pretty straightforward for each one. Uh, all right, so plugging in 25 for each one, I've got uh, 7 times 25, which is like 7 quarters, right? Yeah. 8 times 25 is 200, so that's 175 minus 3 over 2 times 25 squared, which is 625. That's a yummy one. Yum, yum, yum. Minus 5x times 25, so that's 125 x. Uh, next I plug in x squared, so I'll have uh, minus, don't forget we're on the minus side now, right? So subtract, um, I'll go ahead and put a parenthesis just to show that, right? This was the upper side minus the lower side here. Uh, 7x squared minus 3 over 2, that's going to be x to the fourth, and then Right here, I'm going to have minus 5x cubed dx, right? Okay. So then from there, uh, I'm just going to integrate with respect to x. Uh, I have nothing but number portion here. Uh, single x, x squared, x cubed, x fourth. So nothing really like terms other than the first two uh, are going to combine. So let's see. I've got 175 minus 3 over 2 times 625 times x. Uh, minus 125 over 2x squared. And then minus uh, 7 over 3x to the third plus uh, 3 over 10, right, because I'm going to uh, drop the new power x to the fifth, and then minus 5 over 4x to the four, right? And then that's going to be evaluated from negative 5 to 5. So I'm going to punch this in. Okay, so what I've done is I realize that I have symmetric limits and anything with an even power is gonna zero out because of that. So those two pieces uh, went away. And what I'm left with is this thing condensed times 10 because it's five minus negative five, right? So this times 10. Uh, then 5 cubed minus negative 5 cubed 
right? 250. Uh, 5 to the 5th is 3125 minus negative 3125, so 6250 um, times the 3 tenths. Some of the things uh, we're reducing. And then, of course, I came out with negative 19,000 over 3. Now, of course, that does not represent the volume, as I said before. It's just the total of all of the Z values that you're going to get when you have this particular region slicing through that uh, surface of that plane. Okay? Now, real quick, I also could have chosen to do the other direction. And also, sometimes you may be presented with an integral like this, and they may ask you, hey, reverse the directions of x and y. Which, by the way, this is really the same problem uh, as me choosing a different route. If someone had handed me this double iterated integral and said, hey, change the dy and dx around, you can't just switch the, the integral signs around because they're not just numbers, right? One of them is dependent on a variable. So in that case, what you would do is you would go ahead and draw out your region to make sense of it. I would say, look, my y is in between x squared and 25, so it must be this parabola here. And x is going from negative 5 to 5, so it's where these two intersect, right? I would have, I would have drawn it out like this and then said, okay, now how do I reverse the directions? Well, instead of integrating this way, right, with first with the y values, I would have done the x values, right? So I wouldn't have these here like this. I would have picked uh, a y value like right here and notice that I'm integrating this way like this, right? So my inner integral in my, in my double integral, let's go ahead and set up my function. I would have wanted dx first, then dy, right? So that means this integral right here just needs to be dx. And since I have not set forth any other pieces yet, x is integrating from this point in the curve to that point in the same curve. But it's y equals x squared, right? Don't forget that I can rewrite that as x equals plus or minus square root of y. And the plus or minus comes in handy here because what it is is on the negative side, I'll have the negative square root of y. And on the positive side, right, I'll have the positive square root of y. So my dx, x is going this way from negative square root of y up to positive square root of y. And then if I'm picking a y value, right, I want to pick all of my y values from bottom to top. So my dy integral would then iterate from the bottom, 0, up to 25. Okay. If you evaluate this integral, you will find that you get the exact same answer. But uh, since I had some square roots uh, in some of these things, and I would have had to deal with the fractional powers uh, for some of the, the regions that didn't have um, the x's in them and stuff, I chose to do nothing but the, the whole number of powers, right? That, this was the, the less headachey for me. Some people may prefer this particular integral. They will come out to be the same thing as long as you've set up your limits to be uh, correct, though. So just to give you a visual of the integral that we just performed over that region, here is the, the 3D plane. Here's the XY plane. You can see the Y is the green axis and the red is the X axis. And we're integrating over this region here uh, where we've capped out at 25 on the Y axis and it's the function Y equals X squared. So that region in three space, of course, looks like this. And we want to integrate that region um, with the function of this plane in mind okay now as you can see there's a small bit of the of the region that we're integrating that's underneath the plane but the rest of the region right here as you can see is on top of the plane it's over the plane the plane is under the XY plane our surface the red 
surfaces underneath the XY plane for this region over here. And it's above the XY plane for this small region uh, close to the origin here. Okay, so as you can guess, when we're integrating in this region, we're going to get some positive Z values here because our surface is above and then we're going to get a bunch of negative z values for the rest uh, of this region where it's below uh, over here which explains why we ha we got a negative answer for our integral because most of this thing is beneath uh, the xy plane okay so here's what the the surface looks like just the domain piece if i image it onto the plane right if i take the image of the the piece of the domain that we're talking about notice see it's cut like that okay and if i just basically image it onto the plane it looks like that so let me turn off the xy plane right you can see how it shadows itself onto the plane there and then of course the integral is just adding up all of the z values that connect this so if you can imagine adding up all of the z values inside of this volume just everywhere inside uh, of the the volume in between these two pieces is the integration that we've done and don't forget the the little small piece of it that's uh, above the xy plane here if i zoom in you, you'll be able to see it a lot better right we do have this small region above the XY plane right here uh, where the where the surface is uh, going to be a positive there so you can see it has this region and then the rest of the volume is going to be these negative Z values that are beneath the XY plane in here So let's get another example in here of a double integral where they want us to switch the order of integration. As you just seen in the previous scene, um, the, the, the way in which I list the order of integration usually doesn't matter as long as you put your boundaries in correctly. So here the thing to notice is that one of my integrals is based off of one of the other um, variables. So I can't just switch the two integrands and I can't just switch the, the dx and the dy because one of them is based as a function on the other one, right? And the whole thing is technically supposed to be a dy integral on the whole, like as, as far as the final computation. So I, I can't have these y's hanging outside, right? To switch the order of integration here, I'm going to have to look at the region in which I'm integrating here and see if I can't arrange the dependency uh, in a reversed fashion. That's really what it is. I have an x integral that's dependent on y, right? That's the only way that you can get non-rectangular regions using rectangular coordinates. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a, a map of just the domain here, right? So this is the xy plane here. And using that xy plane as my domain, I'm going to write down what this region is that I'm actually integrating over. And then I'm going to see if I can arrange it in a reverse pattern. So let's start by graphing the features. Don't forget these are x values, right? Negative y equals x and 12 minus y squared equals x. So negative y equal to x is simply the line that cuts through quadrants 2 and 4 here. Let's see if I can get this straight enough here. Let's get a little bit more. This will do. All right, so that's 
uh, negative y equals x. Next, we want to draw the shape x equals 12 minus y squared. Well, y squared, x not squared, remember that's going to be a parabola, but it's going to be a horizontally opening one. And since the y squared is negative, it's going to open in the negative x direction, and it's been shifted 12 in the positive x direction. So we're looking at a parabola that has a shape something like this, like this where this mark out here is gonna be 12 on the x-axis, and you can see it's opening in the negative uh, x direction. All right, if you set these two uh, curves equal to each other, by the way, you'll find out exactly why these two numbers are what they are. Oh, uh, let's see, this is 12 minus x. And if you, like I was saying, if you set these two equal to each other. You can see they're both equal to x. Uh, 12 minus y squared is equal to negative y. You'll find that when you solve this, you'll get that y is either 4 or negative 3. So in other words, um, the points where they intersect here is going to be negative 3 on the y-axis and right here this is gonna be four on the y-axis. So really and truly what they're integrating here is my x values are being integrated uh, from the negative y line, right? That's its low value, up to its high value of the parabola curve. So for the x, in, in between negative uh, three and four for the y, the x is gonna start at the line and integrate towards the parabola like that. And it's going to do it all the way from negative 3 up to 4 on the y-axis. So we're looking at our, our x directions doing this when we're integrating. So that's the region that we're getting in between the line and the parabola there uh, between the two intersection points. Okay, so then to reverse the dependency here, I'm going to have to say that this is equal to we're going to start like this. Notice I'm just going to copy the function because the function just gives the z values, right? These are the z values that we're adding up. Those are coming out or going in to the into the plane here, okay? This is just the domain. I want to reverse the integration though. So instead of integrating from left to right the way we're doing with our x values here, our first integration here is y which means I want to integrate from bottom to top like this. Okay, so to do that, let's get some of these out of the way here real quick. To integrate the, the uh, perpendicular direction, the other dimension here, notice that we'll just be integrating like this, from line to parabola, from line to parabola, from line to parabola, from line to parabola. Hey, wait a minute. Look, there's a, there's a separation. Look right here. At this line right here, all of this region on the left, this, is from line to parabola, right? But in this region over here, it's from parabola to parabola. It's from the curve to itself. That's a little bit different, okay? Since the pattern changes line to parabola, parabola to parabola, it changes on this value, I can't do it all in one double integral. I'm going to have to split this into two double integrals because I'm noticing the two uh, regions that have different patterns of lining up the, the integration lines. Okay? Of course, uh, with our rules of integration, it's okay to integrate one region and then integrate another region and then add them up as long as the two regions don't overlap and duplicate any of the domain points. It's the same thing in, uh, in old uh, Calc 1 with your old integration. Whenever you have an integral over uh, a, a, a continuous interval, 
right? And you can split that into two intervals where you integrate from beginning to end and then integrate from beginning to end. As long as they don't overlap, it's fine. Same thing. I can split this region into two regions and make two separate integrals and then add them together and it will still have the same value as integrating the whole region, okay? And since I'm changing the dominance here, or not dominance, I'm switching the order of integration here, I actually have to do this split because of the way the, this integral goes from one object to another, and this region would go from a different object to that top, okay? So I'm gonna split it right there. Um, let's start with the x values, right? This line right here represents where x is equal to negative y. So notice this intersection point right here, since it's y equals four, this would have to be x equals negative four, okay? And then again, same thing. This is negative three at this intersection point. So this means that it would be x equals positive three is the separator line here. So then my first integral is gonna integrate the left-hand region here from negative four to three. And then the right-handed region, notice, is gonna start at x equals three, and it's gonna go to the peak, right? Which is x equals 12. Not drawn to scale, I know, this, this gap should be like way bigger. Yes, it should be. Regardless, okay? The, the left-handed region is integrating from the line up to the parabola. So that means if negative y is equal to x, then y is also equal to negative x. And these are y equals right here, so this would have to be negative x from the bottom to the top, right? And over here, I've got 12 minus y squared equals x. If you solve that for y, notice that you'll get plus or minus square root of 12 minus x is equal to y. Okay, and the plus or minus is because I introduced a square root, right? We usually bring the plus or minus with us. But I only want to pick one of them, right? I'm going from the line to the top of the parabola. So I'm just going to pick the positive one. So I'm going from the line to the parabola square root 12 minus x. Okay? Now on the other one, on the right-sided region, I'm going from the bottom of the parabola to the top of the parabola. So that's easy too, I've already solved for that one. I'm just gonna be going from negative square root of 12 minus x up to positive square root of 12 minus x. And then I've got my integration rewritten in the other format now, okay? I had to do it in two separate pieces just because of the way the regions were arranged. And, and sometimes that's a, uh, a deterrent to some people to want to switch it and to do the integrations, but who knows, maybe sometimes the boundaries work better with the integration when you're plugging things in than the other one. Um, sometimes when you switch these things, the original integral is not workable in its current form. Like maybe you have to do a substitution or something like that and one of the pieces is missing, but when you switch it to the other uh, boundaries, the, the pieces that you need appear in a different order and then all of a sudden it works. So sometimes this is a necessary change, sometimes it's a desirable change, sometimes it's an undesirable change. But no matter what, you can take any one of these integrals and reverse the order of integration. If it's just numbers, you can simply switch them, but if there is dependency on the inner integral, then you've got to look at your domain and make sure that you are reversing that dependency correctly. So I'd like to finish up this lecture uh, showing a couple of quick applications that evolve naturally from our simple integrations as well. <clears throat> Remember, if you integrate with just dx, in other words, I'm integrating the function equal to one, right? Then basically I'm just going to be calculating the length of the interval uh, that I'm integrating across. Um, you could also think of it as an area of a rectangle but um, the, the actual answer to the calculation can be akin more to a length uh, because we also do have integrals of other things besides x, like integral ds when we're doing arc length of, of some uh, 
curve or something like that. So in, uh, a lot of times the, the easier connection here is to think of this as a length. If I'm doing an integral of just dx, I'm adding up all of the little dx pieces and all I'm going to get is the length on the x-axis, right? And also, if I were to take a length, 1 minus b over a, and integrate some uh, function and divide by that b over a like this, then I'm actually getting what we call the average value of a function, right? Uh, one of those generalizations of the integral mean value theorem. And one of the, the nicer results that's used in a lot of different branches, for example, like statistics, uh, would definitely want to be able to take the mean of a continuous distribution, right? They use this for that. Those, these generalize, right? So if I do a double integral just with a dA, in other words, just taking all of the little area pieces, right? The function is just the number one. Then really all I'm doing is adding up all of the area pieces over some region R, right? So if I do a double integral over some region, just dA, the answer is the area of the region that I'm integrating over, right, in the, in the xy plane. And the next step up, we also have the, the integral mean value theorem in multivariable versions, okay? The, um, the average value of a multivariable function is if you take the double integral over some region of the function, and then divide by the area of that region, you're going to get the average value of that function inside of that region, right? The average Z value uh, in that whole entire region. Okay, so let's do a couple of examples here. Here, if I'm doing the integral from zero to two, the integral of uh, x squared to four minus x, and this isn't really dA anymore. I've already got the iterations on there. So this is really dy dx, right? dy times dx in this case is equal to dA. So uh, I'll just go ahead and write it out. This is the iterated form. And what I'm doing is I'm letting x go from zero to two, and I'm letting y be in between these two different functions. Uh, the blue curve here is x squared minus four, and the, the red curve is the four minus x squared. And notice I have no function in here. So all I'm gonna be doing is finding the area uh, of this region here, okay? So the integral dy is just gonna be y, and it's gonna be evaluated top minus bottom, right? So I've got integral from zero to two, and I've got y evaluated from top to bottom, dx. But notice what this gives us is just the top function minus the bottom function here, dx. Now that should look somewhat familiar. From Calc 1 you had uh, how to find the area between two curves and it was integrate over the region top curve minus bottom curve. So as you can see that, that generates naturally from the idea of what a double integral actually is. Let's go ahead and finish it up. Uh, this is gonna give me the integral from zero to two of eight minus two x squared, right, dx. And then that's gonna be eight uh, x minus two thirds x cubed from zero to two. Uh, both of these are zero when I plug in zero, so that piece is gone. And that's going to leave me with 16 minus uh, 16 thirds, right? Because it's eight times two on that one, uh, which is really just going to give me two thirds of 16, which is 32 thirds, right? Okay. So that would be the area of the region trapped in between these two curves here. Okay, now let's take that same thing and now find the average of a function over that region R. And our function is x times e to the negative y. So what I'll be doing is I will take uh, one over the area of the region 
which is the 32 thirds. And I'll be multiplying that times the double integral converted into iterated integrals over that same region. Notice I'm using the same boundaries here. And they better be, right? These boundaries give me a certain region, and this happens to be the area of that region. So I'm doing you know, one over that so that I can uh, average this value out. x e to the negative y dy dx, like that. OK? So then that's equal to uh, 3 over 32. And then I've got the integral from 0 to 2. And x is just along for the ride, right? x is not a, a, a party to the dy integral. So really, I can just kind of take this x outside of just that first integral, right? It hits the, hits the wall of the x integral, but it can come out of the y integral. And then e to the negative y uh, is just negative e to the negative y, right? And it's going to be evaluated uh, from the, the x squared minus 4 to the 4 minus x squared, uh, and then dx, right? So then from here, I can set up this integral as um, the 3 over 32 integral from 0 to 2. I've got x times... And then notice the negative, right? It's going to reverse the order of my subtraction here, this negative right here. I, I can just reverse the ordering here. And then also the negative in the y is going to reverse these things. So what I end up with is e to the 4 minus x squared minus e to the x squared minus 4, right? The, the double negations there sort of uh, pattern themselves out uh, dx. Okay, so let's go through that one more time. If I put this in here, then I get negative 4 plus x squared, that's this one, but it has a negative in front, right? So like this. And then if I put x squared minus 4 in, I get negative x squared and plus 4, like this. But since it's the lower value, it's minus the negative, so I get positive. And all I did was I wrote it in just sort of a more straightforward pattern there. Okay, so then... What I want to do is distribute this x to both of these, okay, like this. So there'll be an x in front of that one now. And the reason for that is because that will make it very easy for me to do substitutions on each of these. Notice the inside derivative here is negative 2x, and the inside derivative here is 2x, right? So I've almost got that on each of these. If I, if I multiply by 2 on each, here and here, then that will give me my substitution that I need. And to balance that out, all I need to do is multiply by 2 in the denominator here, which will give me a 64. So now I've got that integral set up for double substitution, well, just single substitution in two places. Um, I've got 3 over 64 times... Uh, the patterned, I've got negative, because I needed negative 2x for this one, right? So I've got negative e to the 4 minus x squared. This was already negative and I didn't need it, so again it's minus uh, e to the x squared minus 4. And that's going to be from 0 to 2 uh, on there. Okay? So let's see. Now I've got 3 over 64 <clears throat> times, when I plug in 2 on each of these, notice it's getting me e to the 0 and e to the 0. Uh, so I'm just getting negative 1 and negative 1. So I'm just going to get negative 2. And then minus... Uh, when I plug in the zeros, I'm going to get uh, e to the 4 and e to the negative 4. But both of them are negative, right? So that's going to give this a plus, and then it'll just be e to the 4 uh, plus e to the negative 4, like this. So 
So this is really as low as we can get with uh, without a calculator. Let's go ahead and crunch this one up real quick just to see what we get. Uh, okay, so e to the 4 plus e to the negative 4 and then minus 2, right? Times 3 divide by 64. So I'm getting 2.4664. 2.4664-ish is my, my average value of this function. Okay, so on this little region, this particular function averages this particular z value. It'll have some z values that are higher, some that are lower. It may even have some negative z values in there. Um, no, it won't because x is always positive and uh, the exponential never gives negatives. So it's going to be all positive, but some of the values will be lower than 2.4, some of them will be higher than 2.4, and then if you just take the entire region there, it averages out to, to this value. So I hope this has helped you realize uh, how we're stepping into the world of multivariable integration and how I can take a double integral and turn it into iterated integrals which really work like uh, partial integration, kind of like partial differentiation. Um, stay tuned now uh, for when we start doing them in other coordinate systems.